All right, well, thanks everyone. Like Lynette said, I'm Sam, and I'm yeah, a PhD candidate at the University of Newcastle. So we'll just jump into it, shall we? First, I'd just like to acknowledge that my home in Newcastle is on Awabakal lands, and that the majority of my field work was conducted under lands under the traditional ownership of the Tharawal people down in Wollongong. So I probably really don't have to tell this audience that frogs are really cool, and they're also really diverse. So you can see from the screen, we've got a giant burrowing frog and a green stream frog, and they're not only unique and diverse in the way that they look, but also in the habitats that they occupy. So they play really important roles in these ecosystems too. So they are really vital links in the food chain in that they eat a lot of different things, and they're also eaten by a whole bunch of other dudes. So they are really structuring the ecosystem that they're a part of. So as we've also touched on previously, they also help control those invertebrate pests, such as uh, those pesky mosquitoes. And they're also really cool, which I mean, it just sort of goes without the saying, doesn't it? There we go. However, our amphibian friends are in a bit of a spot of bother. So when I say amphibian, we've got frogs, toads, salamanders, newts, sicilians, all a bunch of cool critters. So around the world, around a third of amphibian species are threatened or have actually already declined into a dis extinction. And so about 44% of amphibian species are in decline around the world. So that's pretty intense. And Australia is not exempt from these declines. So in Australia, about 20% of Australian frogs are considered to be threatened. And this creates a lot of conservation challenges because the frogs that are in decline, we often don't know a lot about them. So it makes it really hard to develop conservation strategies when we don't know much about these frogs that we're trying to save. And so what's contributing to these declines? So it's a bunch of interacting factors, but the main ones are habitat loss and modification, so often the, the destruction of habitat, infectious disease, which I'm sure we'll hear a few more talks about coming up. Um, so this is basically the COVID-19 equivalent in the frog world. And the effects of a changing climate, which we can see from these South Wales floods, is all over the place at the moment. And also our invasive species. And so these threats often are not only acting um, by themselves, but they're also compounding and exacerbating their singular impacts. So they can create a lot more, uh, a lot more damage to our frog species than when they're acting alone. And so this is where my PhD comes in. So I'm having a look at two uh, frog species and having a look at how some of these threaten threatening processes are acting upon these cool species. So it's my pleasure to introduce Watson's tree frog, so the top picture out here. So the southern heath frog, Latora watsoni, and little John's tree frog, or the northern heath frog, Latora little Johni. So when I started my PhD, this is one species of frog. And as I was progressing through my PhD, my PhD supervisor split them into two species, which I didn't know about. So now I have two species for the price of one, but it's also double the work, so I don't know. I'm on the fence. But these guys are really cool, and I think they're pretty handsome. So they've got their characteristic orange thighs and a really sort of reedy call. And that's really the only way you can tell them apart. So I'm sure. You can see the photos, they look basically exactly the same, don't they? You can't, you can't tell them apart from photos. And so, as a sort of Victorian fun fact as well, our Victorian uh, Watson's tree frog are actually really warty and bumpy in appearance. So they've got really warty skin for some reason. I don't really know what that happens, but they're just weird. And so working with these two species has its complications. So across the landscape that these frogs occur, they're really quite difficult to detect, even when they are present in the landscape. So you go to one site and they're there, and the next night they're gone. So they're, they're a bit strange like that. And they've also got a really patchy distribution across the areas when they occur in New South Wales and Victoria. And so both of these species are among Australia's 26 most imperiled frog species. So there's really cause for, for concern regarding their persistence into the future. And as of January this year, they were added to the endangered list under the uh, Environmental Protection and Biodiversity Act, which is our sort of major legislative piece of um, sort of governing conservation of species at the federal level in Australia. And so what was I planning to do with all this and how did it all come about? So basically, because I, we knew so little about these frogs, the aim of my PhD was to really just investigate their basic ecology and to inform these really huge knowledge gaps because we really didn't know anything about these frogs and, and where they occur and what habitat they like to occur in. And so I was mainly focusing on habitat selection at both the tadpole phase and the frog phase. So what habitats both of these phases like to occur in. 
as part of my PhD, I also had a look at some of the mining impacts in a particular area um, in Wollongong. However, the subject of this talk will mainly investigate the ecology for these species. Okay, so jumping into how we did it. So the, uh, this project was split into three different study areas in the south coast of New South Wales. So we have, do I have a clicker? Yes, 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 I do. <laughs> So we had one study area located near Willemgong in red, which is our mine lease area, and two control sites. Um, so the first was Darawal National Park, also near Willemgong, and the second we had was in Palmer Creek Nature Reserve and also Joangala National Park. And these two areas were where we were finding our Latoria Watsonai, so the southern species. And so how did we go about finding the frogs? Basically, it was any kid's dream. You just go out with a big net and you kind of poke around in the water and you find tadpoles, and that was about it. Just kidding. It was a bit harder than that. <laughs> so during the day, we would do just that and dip net for tadpoles across the stream habitat. But then when night fell, we'd also um, switch over to frog surveys. So these were called visual encounter surveys and basically uh, involve going along the stream transects and having a look in the vegetation and capturing any frogs you find. And so we did this across 31 sites in the study areas you've just seen. And this equated to 190, sorry, yeah, 191 tadpole surveys during the day, 240 frog surveys at night time. And across all these surveys, we got encountered over 390 frogs of both species and over 18,800 tadpoles. And I had very wrinkly hands, as you can imagine. It wasn't great. It was also very cold because there are winter breeding frogs, so not ideal. And so what did we find across all these surveys? So using a really nasty piece of uh, statistical modeling equipment, we had a look at habitat relationships between these two frog species. And perhaps probably one of the most surprising things is that we found that fish were actually the, had the strongest influence on determining habitat selection among these, both of these species of tree frog. And this is something we really hadn't expected. So both the abundance of Little John's tree frog and the presence of uh, Watson's tree frog actually declined if there were any fish species present. And this was not only invasive species like your mosquito fish, but also just native fish and eels as well. And so these negative impacts also flowed onto the tadpoles. So we never encountered tadpoles in habitats occupied by fish species. Um, uh, in addition to having a look at the impacts of fish, we also identified a suite of other habitat relationships that both Latoria Watsonai and Latoria Little Giant exhibited between their habitat. So these habit uh, associations included stream order, pond volume, mean pond depth, and the ephemerality of the pond. So this is um, how much the pond, or how much time the pond holds water over a specified time period. However, these habitat associations also had a bit of a trend within them as well, and that we thought, are fish actually shaping the habitat associations for these as well? And so we had a bit of a look in greater detail for these. So starting off with stream water. So this refers to the stream placement within the catchment. So where a stream starts is in the headwater, and that's your first order stream. And so as the stream gets bigger and more streams are added, it gains um, a different number in, in the order. So it becomes a second order stream when another stream is added to it, and then a third order stream when another is added, and so on and so forth, and that's kind of jazz. But we found um, for both species that um, first to third order streams are actually preferred for the habitat. And within these streams, they actually um, encompass smaller streams that had gentler flow, and that was the key thing about their habitat. They really preferred to breathe in streams that had slow flowing uh, water. And not only is the, are these first to third order streams gentle and good for egg deposition, but they also discourage fish presence. So because they're a bit more ephemeral and a bit smaller and a bit higher up in the catchment, often the fish can't travel up there. So the head, headwater streams are less likely to be fishy and also really good for egg deposition for these two species. And moving on to pond volume. So these, um, these characteristics are more about the overall shape of the pond and so there was kind of a Goldilocks stone for um, habitat selection by both Latoria Watsonai and Latoria Little Giant. So across the entire study, we averaged out the depth for all the ponds we sampled, and the average depth that they preferred to be in was 25 centimetres. So not too deep, not too shallow, it was pretty much just right. However, there was a bit of a range in the, the habitats occupied by the, the frogs. So we did see them breeding in, in streams and ponds that were um, more than 72 centimetres deep. And we also found tadpoles in ponds as shallow as 1.5 centimetres. 
So they are quite adaptable in the breeding habitat that they'll use. So this kind of selection is a bit of a trade-off as well, in that the ponds have to be deep enough to, for the tadpoles to escape predation and undergo metamorphosis. Um, but there's also, these were shared by a bunch of other tadpole species as well. So it seems that these ponds are in high competition um, and prime real estate for other frog species using them as well. And so lastly, we've got pond ephemerality. So again, this is how long the pond holds water for. And so for both species, we found that their frogs um, habitually selected more permanent ponds compared to those that dried out a bit more often. And again, this is a bit of a trade-off between the tadpole phase and the minimizing the risk of predation. So the ponds had to hold water long enough for the, for the um, tadpoles to undergo metamorphosis, so to turn into little frogs. But they also had to dry out yeah, it's some intermediate period to discourage the presence of frogs. So habitat selection here was a bit of a balancing act. So you had yeah, balancing between drying off and also allowing the, the tadpoles to actually turn into frogs. So wrapping everything up, what did we find from all this sort of habitat analysis and data crunching? So first and foremost, we got a fantastic insight into heath frog ecology. So we really got to know these frogs a bit more than we did at the start. And really what we've revealed is that breeding habitat selection was guided by these pond features. Um, and that at the end of the day, fish are not frog friends. And they actually have a really strong impact on how the habitat is being selected by Little John's tree frog and Watson's tree frogs. And yeah, these fish food ponds seem to act as prime real estate in the frog world and there's a bit of competition um, for uh, egg deposition and tadpole development in them. Um, and so now we have this data, we can use these uh, pond characteristics to help in the construction of supplementary habitat, which is really important um, with the conservation of the species moving forward. And we can also use this ecological knowledge to move forward with um, the basis of conservation and inform our conservation strategies for this species because they're still in a bit of bother um, in that they're present in really low numbers and really isolated populations across the landscape. And this is particularly in light of the 2019-2020 bushfires. So thanks very much. And I'd just like to thank our industry partner and the amazing field team. Thank you.